everybody. Welcome to this week's learning space. Um, my name is Nicole Gallucci. I am a postdoc with CosmoQuest, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts today, Pamela Gay and Georgia Bracey. No, Wait, that one. Pamela <laughs> just dropped down. Hi, I'm Georgia. <laughs> Georgia is our formal yeah, educator at CosmoQuest, um, and Pamela Gay. Yeah, she's mm. as it were. She shares in a different building and having trouble as well. So this this will be interesting. It'll be a good ride. Um, and we are joined today by Hello. Connie Walker and Scott Cardell. Hi. Hello. Hi. They're over in Arizona at the NOAO National Optical Astronomical Observatory, and for some reason, it's also snowing in the desert today. So uh, how is that? <laughs> It was totally unbelievable. I could not believe it. I was on a telecon. I looked outside my window, and there were these huge snowflakes coming down, and my eyes just went. I, I couldn't speak for about two minutes. <laughs> it's crazy. bad for astronomy, oh, wow. but you know, we need the, the moisture, that's for sure. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I've, I've been seeing pictures coming back from um, the observatories around, uh, around Tucson, and, yeah, everyone's just like, I don't know what to do with this fluffy <laughs> stuff. That's pretty fun. Uh, so when it's not precipitating fluffy things from the sky uh, and, and completely cloud covered, uh, there's a gorgeous night sky for us to enjoy and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, the issue of dark skies, preserving our dark skies, preserving our night skies, uh, and the Globe at Night project. Uh, right? So, um, oh, and, and I know Connie and Scott have our demo of the week for us so I didn't have to scramble to get one together today so we'll get to that uh, when you guys are ready. Uh, so, uh, Connie, why don't you tell us a little bit about what is Globe at Night? Well, Globe at Night is a citizen science campaign. It, it uh, measures how bright or how dark your night sky is, and it does this in a very easy manner. And it invites people all over the world to be so a researcher for a night or two, or as how many nights they would like to do that, and to um, go outside, look at a constellation very similar to Orion, and look at what it, it appears to be, how many stars there might be, not counting them, but actually just trying to see what the faintest star might be and comparing what they see to one of seven charts. And each of the charts gets, um, it has more and more stars on them, it gets progressively fainter. So um, it's really kind of neat. So like chart one will be like you have in New York City, just two stars maybe towards Orion, <laughs> and uh, charts yeah, yeah. will be like what you might have in a national park. And so they just choose the chart and put that online, and it goes into a big database with a bunch of other data from around the world. Um, I just wanted to point out real quick as well for our audience, uh, I forgot to mention at the beginning of the show, uh, if you have comments or questions or want to um, say anything about these, these dark skies activities we're looking at, we're talking about, uh, you can comment in several places. You can comment on the YouTube page where this is broadcasting. We'll see that. You can comment on the event page on, uh, on any of the other pages uh, that this is posting on, on Google+. Uh, if you are watching somewhere else and want to use Twitter, use the hashtag learning space, and we will see your comment there as well. So we'll try and get through your questions uh, throughout the show. Hi, Pamela. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Pamela. <laughs> so sorry. As, as we were talking about before we, we went live, um, Nicole, Georgia, and I are all at three different locations in Edwardsville, although the two of them are probably about 100 feet apart. Well, yeah, um, she's down the hall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So both our campus and my home are having bad internet, and it's two completely different service providers. So we're concerned that the Midwestern storms are... Um, borking something between Illinois and California. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully the show will you. not go as badly as the ice storms that are expected to hit us tomorrow. Right. Yay. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, can you tell us, Connie, about, a little bit about what you mean by light pollution? What do we mean when we talk about light pollution? Well, you can think of light pollution as the, um, the effect is the sky is sort of washed out by the streetlights mostly from cities that are not sufficiently uh, shielded. And that's the primary um, reason for why we get stars that are washed out at night, you know, contribution to light pollution. So the more streetlights that you have unshielded, the, 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 um, the, the harder the problem will be to, to see stars in the night sky. And so I, I, you're too young, Nicole, but when I was a young kid, they had two major campaigns. 
they had one campaign on anti-littering and another one on anti-smoking. And I think in some respect yeah. that changed the culture uh, a bit. It changed the mindset of people uh, because you don't, I think percentage-wise, see quite as many people smoking or littering as you did when I was a, a youngster. And so what we're trying to do here is to uh, bring awareness to the public of, uh, of the, the, the problem of light pollution and how it is increasing over you know, the past few decades, uh, becoming a much more serious problem, but that we can actually do something on a local level to prevent it from uh, getting any worse. And so as you can see here um, on, well, on the previous map, you have um, the night sky image all over the world, the one you just had up, Nicole. And it's very, very easy to see where the cities are located. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that is because the, lights are go the, the light is going up into space where it's not being used, right? It's just totally wasted light. So you'll see, for instance, in the United States over there, uh, mostly the eastern half of the United States, um, there's barely any dark areas there. Um, when, um, when we get, well, I should say, in the United States, for instance, there's about Two or three billion dollars a year that are wasted. It's over two. In fact, it's enough to pay for another mission to Mars, like Curiosity, every year. So that's pretty impressive. So, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's an amazing <laughs> thing. And uh, the very next picture that you did have there, you could show for a, for a minute there or a second. The very next slide. Yeah, this is the a good graphic in terms of how how it's getting worse over the years. So you go from the the late 50s all the way up until when our kids are having kids and over those decades the, uh, the light pollution problem is getting worse and worse and worse and so what we're trying to do here at the National Observatory is to bring awareness to the public in terms of uh, a campaign like Globe at Night so that people n not necessarily start turning off their lights per se it's not quite that kind of thing we want people to stay safe but to learn how to light responsibly and that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I, I, I love how it, it becomes light responsibly. So it's like, we're not going to get you to stop drinking. We're going to get you to drink responsibly. <laughs> well, this is just the next step of, of uh, we're, we're going to get people to use electricity responsibly. And it, it really is profound how much the change is happening. And we can't stop it because, unfortunately, while some of the light most of the light is caused by stupid things like lights going up the front of buildings and then out into space. Um, you also do get nice downward facing light that then hits shiny objects and reflects straight upwards. And since we don't have a fully absorbent asphalt, um, there always will be reflected light. But that's at least not nearly as big of a problem. Right. And so what is the percentage? So the, you know, asphalt, uh, when it's brand new, is very similar in reflectivity to the moon. And, and if you look at the, the full moon, it's like crazy bright. Yeah. And uh, you put a lot of light shining down onto asphalt, and a fair amount of that's going to go back up as well, about 9%. Mm -hmm. And, of course, as asphalt ages, it actually gets more reflective. Mm -hmm. and it gets brighter. Well, comets, for example, we think of as these really bright things in the sky, but those are some of the darkest surfaces in the solar system. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be like a dark, gravelly thing if you could actually hold it in your hand. That's a really good comparison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then how does Globe at Night contribute to this? Um, I know you do, you do individual campaigns. I know there's another one coming up in about a week or so. Right. Yeah, this began as a, a one-time-a-year campaign just in March when it was about the equinox so that both the northern and southern hemispheres could use Orion, which is right on the you know, right on the uh, uh, celestial equator there. Um, and it could be seen by both um, the northern and southern hemispheres pretty easily around the equinox. So we would pick a time when the moon wasn't out in the early evening so that kids could be involved, you know, people from 8 to 80 could be involved and, and take data. And, um, and so basically you just go out in the early evening and look at Orion at that point and, uh, and, and as I said before, compare to charts what you see and select it and put online. But that grew over time to now five campaigns and so when there is no moon for about a 10 day period in the early evening, um, we go outside from January to May uh, from 8 to 10 o'clock depending on what latitude you're at because it's still fairly light at 
uh, sometimes as you get towards the summer in the northern latitudes and southern latitudes for the other half of the year. But um, but still, you know, um, it's a good it, it's still a good period, a good opportunity, I would say, to do the observations uh, and contribute to this campaign. The nice thing about Globe at Night is it's shockingly easy. <laughs> so if you want to go and, and do something to contribute to the campaign, it's not an involved, advanced, difficult process. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so Connie's right. I mean, you know, kids of all ages can, can participate, and it's, it's a worthwhile thing. Yeah, it really is um, easy. It's one, I always say it's one of my favorite citizen science programs because it really is um, kid friendly, family friendly, you know, everybody friendly and teacher friendly, which is what I always look for. Um, the site itself, you guys have great resources for teachers, parents, kids, everybody on the site. The instructions are really clear and lots of great activities if you want to do some uh, preparatory kinds of things with students um, inside the classroom or at home there's just a, it's a great set of resources there so you're right it really is it's it's very easy and kids and parents you know could do it independently of you know school in the classroom did you want to show the site perhaps I could share yeah, did we give the site or uh, and I could I, I put the link on I think you can the event page Love um, at night. Dot so if org. you guys are watching there, it's globeatnight.org. That's right there. Uh, so my internet being slow, let's, oh, you got it, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, there we go, we can, we, can, we can push that out. Yeah, yeah. And so you have across okay, the top. Okay, so it looks like, yep. yeah. You can, go you ahead, have, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you have all sorts of resources. You have... Um, if you go to the learning page, you can go and, and do a sort of a light pollution interactive and, and look at, for instance, any of the three constellations that we have and um, choose a magnitude to see how, how bad it would get. So if you go to lower magnitudes, you get less stars. If you go to higher magnitudes, you get a lot of stars. And you can also choose your uh, location. So if we did it in, in South America, you notice how, how the orientation of Orion changes. So it kind of yes. flips. <laughs> He's sleeping right now. <laughs> He's on his head if you go further south. So it's kind of a neat thing to teach kids that too. Um, but there's a lot of other resources you can uh, get here too, from mythology to different kinds of interactives. If you want to even just learn where to find Orion in the night sky, um, you, can, you can use that particular interactive. And then um, we have... Um, your instructions on how to observe, and each of these orange areas here are links to other materials you may want to read if you want to learn more about magnitude charts. What is a magnitude? What do you mean by stellar magnitude? And uh, what a lat latitude and longitude is? Because for a kid in school, for instance, or even for some people, they don't know uh, what you mean by latitude and longitude or how to find it for your for your own location. So all of that's kind of um, kind of taught here, and um, and so if you, for instance, I don't know if I can, okay, so you can see this in one fell swoop here, the magnitude charts, again, get, yeah. get more stars as you go along, and you can change, if you're in a different latitude, you can change the orientation here on the screen as well to different um, locations, uh, north and south. And, and this shows just how totally screwed up the magnitude system is because earlier you, people may have heard you say, so you, you switch it to a higher magnitude and suddenly there's more stars, and and that, that's because higher magnitude means substantially fainter objects. Higher number, fainter stars, it's backwards, we deal with it, it's astronomy, we're kind of crazy that way. I blame my ancestors, the Greeks, you know, they must have, <laughs> yes. they had no television so they had a sip a lot of wine and this is what they came up with. <laughs> so that's how that works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So Here's we all need course. to go to Greece and do Globe at Night there because it will make the most sense. Oh, that's that's my desire, actually. Sure. <laughs> Pamela, um, aren't you going to a conference in Greece this Yeah, summer? Connie and I may both be there uh, with Rosa Doran and the Galileo Teacher Training Program and a bunch of other amazing yeah. European educators ah, really? this summer. I think oh, you need uh, to do that. Even though it's not an official Globe at Night campaign time, I think you need to do that. <laughs> 
So, so how like, do look you at us, we're hipparchus. <laughs> how, how do you choose when to do globe at night? Because I'm sure things like snow cover and stuff like that must must confuse your results. Well, that's a, that's a good one. Um, let's see. Let me get. I'm trying to figure out how to get back on the screen. Hit the screen. <laughs> oh, this, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, well, we determine it just because we know when the moon is not going to be up in the early evening. Uh, you can predict that from looking at the lunar phases. And so usually it's somewhere between like a few days before third quarter all the way until uh, new moon. That's a pretty much when the uh, there's like from 8 to 10 at night, kids and adults can go outside and, and take their measurements. And, and of course, because it's globe at night, we have people in the southern hemisphere where it's summer now. Yeah. Right. So... And, and it's it's pretty interesting though. Uh, you have some you have summer vacation actually <laughs> when global night starts in January down in the southern hemisphere. So you don't see them ramp up until March. So they're expecting a lot uh, this March. But at least they're not freezing. That's yeah. Not freezing. Yes. <laughs> like we're doing right here. And I have people from Finland emailing me and saying, "I'm so sorry. It was so cloudy. We couldn't take any measurements." <laughs> and I'm saying, "Okay, don't yeah. worry. Three more campaigns." <laughs> We have a question from Chris Rand on the YouTube site. Uh, since he's up at some crazy hour, like 4.30 in the morning, like some of us are often, uh, can, can they do observations at that time? Well, yeah, as long as, the moon, as long as the moon is not out, uh, it's a natural light bulb in the night sky, so you don't want that out there because you won't be able to determine what your um, light pollution contribution is from artificial sources. So. Uh, as long as that's not out, um, send me the measurement. Um, there's a particular file I can also post with Nicole that we use to record. It's an, like a spreadsheet, and uh, then that could be sent back to me if you'd like. Uh, we usually give those out for people who are taking you know, like over 100 measurements, but um, if it's at an odd time that is not during the campaign, then I would say please use that um, spreadsheet and get it back to me, and we'll make sure it gets on the database, because otherwise the database is actually closed. It only is open during the campaign periods. But, but in the future when you're running campaigns, do, do observations during campaign windows have to occur only between 8 and 10 p.m., or can they go any time the moon isn't up? No, you, it can be done during the campaign periods, which is perfectly fine when the moon's not up. Yeah. Cool. Okay, cool. Right. Very cool. Uh, and then you have some apps as well, as I understand it. Oh, yeah. We, we have this uh, thing called the web app, and people look at us a little crazy when we say that because it's, it's not, con you know, it doesn't sound right. Um, it's actually not an app as you know it traditionally that you buy from the Apple Store or something. It's just what we have as a report page on the web as part of our website, but we've made it so that it is useful on any phone at all, not just an iPhone or an Android, uh, but any phone and uh, any tablet and uh, any computer. So um, what it looks like, and I, I could just screen share shortly here. Oh, I think I have, I have that up. You have it too? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Is this it? Good. Thank you. Is that yeah. it? Okay. You got it? Good. Okay. All right. And then, um, so what you see there basically um, is it's very easy. If you have a smart device, whether it be a phone or a tablet, uh, and, and of course your computer will do it automatically, it, it puts in the date and time uh, and your location just automatically so it knows where you are it knows the date and time from the iPhone or the tablet and uh, you don't have to even lift a finger so it's that easy and then the only two things that you must put in other than that is the uh, number three where it says how dark was the night sky so you choose your chart and you will see at the bottom of the chart all these little thumbnail windows or thumbnail images and you just basically flip through them, as maybe Nicole's doing now, I don't know. Oh, you're not. Okay, um, let me screen share uh, this. No. <laughs> yeah, okay. she's on a picture sure. of the site. Yeah, I just have the picture up. Can I show them this? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So you flip through um, the thumbnail images, and you can see how those stars get, you know, more and more populated because you're able to look at fainter and fainter stars as you go uh, towards higher magnitudes, which are called the limiting magnitudes. That's how faint you can see for a star. And so that's, um, that's the only thing you have to do is pick that and how, how cloudy or not your night sky is. So you can see the choices there. There are only four choices and we made them pictorial so they're kind of understandable in almost any language. Now what, what all does this data that, that's being collected get used for? Whoops, I just, oh, hold on. You're for still a here. You're fine. You're fine. 
Yeah, you know what happened is I changed to a different <clears throat> window. So let me get. Um, <laughs> so we can see you. You can't see us. We can see you. Okay. <clears throat> there we are. <laughs> I am so sorry. Your question again. I'm sorry. Uh, so, um, what all is the data getting used for? Okay. Well, um, it gets used for a number of different things. Um, we're, we're exploring more and more as time goes on. But for instance, we have projects with uh, the, the uh, Arizona Game and Fish Department where we actually examined um, uh, the lesser long-nosed bat, believe it or not. And we took the telemetry and put these little radios on their feet and followed them across, you know, <laughs> about 25 kilometers across town and collected a bunch of telemetry. And then uh, this was, I know, isn't it funny? You think like, you know, that was the reaction of many astronomers at our observatory. Say, what? <laughs> what are you doing? And, and, and then we compared this to the, to the globe at night data. It was the light pollution data. And we had, you know, in Tucson, because we started it here and in, uh, at, in Chile, actually, um, they, we have with like 3,000 data points, just, you know, the visual data points looking at Orion. And we have another 1,000 measurements with the sky quality meter that I could tell you about in a little while. And... <clears throat> And that in itself, we, by comparing those two databases, we were trying to analyze, um, you know, whether or not we should make the laws stricter here for the protection of these bats, um, because they seem to be pre uh, preferentially traveling around the city, basically, and avoiding the bright areas. And after much uh, environmental kind of manipulation of the data, which is amazing, how, what the kind of math they use, um, I, I can't even... Describe and when an astronomer it. says that, it's oh, always yeah. important. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Gotta be some math. The, this is a PhD astronomer going, oh God, the math. Um, <clears throat> the statistics is really something. So it came down to three major parameters that really affected the situation, and the you know one of those three was the light pollution level or l level of lighting. Um, so that that was kind of interesting, and they're still uh, we're still trying to get them to write this up. But it was a really neat project, and this is with a research experiences for undergraduate students, two students, two oh, summers. Great. It was really nice. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it's amazing that um, it doesn't. The light pollution just doesn't affect humans. It affects other species hanging around on the planet, yeah. right? Yeah, that that ties to a question we got uh, from Chris Midden on YouTube. Um, whether there's any research on the impact of light pollution on humans, animals, insects, uh, particularly in the Midwest or or anywhere. Well, uh, I can so tell you that talking about all, the bats. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. There are definitively um, uh, studies being done on humans, and, and there's various types of uh, ways it affects our health. And there are, are studies being done by uh, I think it was uh, University of, of Thomas Jefferson is it University? For Stephen Watts. Uh, that was, I think, Bob, uh, Bud Brainerd. But, um, oh, okay. And, and then there's Stephen, there's uh, David Blask, I believe his name is. Yeah, and, you're right. Yeah, and there's some other um, um, medical scientists that are doing studies on either um, how it affects our sleep and also how it affects our melatonin levels, and that relates to uh, our, our, the chances of getting cancer. So believe it or not, uh, not necessarily for people who just drive around at night with lots of lights on. It's for people who are night shift workers, basically. Oh dear. You know, up, you know, eight hours a night under lots and lots of light and not really getting the kind of rest that they need to repeat their melatonin levels. And that's what actually has ties to the risk of getting a couple different kinds of cancers. So just just to try and clarify that a little bit, <clears throat> is it from from not having a place without with blackout curtains to sleep, or is it it it's the lack of blackout curtains for sleeping during the day, or alternatively, having a bright bedroom due to the street light outside at night? So for for those of us that. Was that a warning bell? No. <laughs> <laughs> that my promise. Um, sorry, I was buzzed off. Um, for, for, for those of us that keep kind of a normal schedule where we're active in the daytime and less so at night, there's a lot of things that, that can be done to introduce light into your evening, into your sleeping, that mm -hmm. can be a problem. So, for instance, I have a cable box in, in my bedroom with the TV with crazy bright LEDs on yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Black tape over them so that I can sleep in a, in a dark room. 
Um, I have an electric toothbrush with the brightest blue LED you've ever seen. You could like, I don't know, signal the space station with it. It's got black tape over it. And blue light in particular seems to be a real problem because blue, as in the blue sky, keys the body to daytime. And yeah. so one of the things that, that, that I've got on my, my laptop for home is actually something that changes the color temperature of my screen so that during the night it's a warmer color yeah blue to, to cut down on on that influence for me now we do know that people that are doing shift work often their 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 um, sense of day and night can be really skewed um, particularly when they do it for a while and then they don't and then they try to go back to a regular day night cycle and then the, you know telescope operators astronomers <laughs> sounds are, like me and Pamela every week <laughs> yeah yes find, find people to, to potentially have these kinds of problems it, it often isn't you know a street light outside but it certainly can be um, that kind of an issue as well and and this is the software that he was talking about. I actually have it on my computer as well. It's called Flux. Yeah. And if you do Google Hangouts, it can serve two purposes. One, you can adjust the color of your screen so you don't look blue and garish when you're hanging out at night. Um, and the other is because it does automatically change the temperature of your screen in terms of color temperature as the sun goes down. As the sun outside goes down, your screens get redder and redder. So I'm actually experiencing this during the hangout. Um, I, I have studio lighting in here, but my screens are getting redder and redder as we talk. Probably not a good thing if you're going to do a lot of image processing. And yeah, don't. Yeah, it, it has the ability to disable it for an hour at a time or to just completely turn it off. Uh, so I regularly ruin my ability to, to go to bed at a irrational rational hour um, by turning it off to work on Photoshop. Oh, wow. And then, you know, uh, part of that, that question before was about effects to the natural world. And we, we should remember that our lights um, do have an impact on the natural world. They don't have apps for their laptops that they can adjust or, yeah. or, or curtains that they can pull. So um, there's a, a, a certainly an effect on not just bats, like Connie mentioned, but, but birds and insects and sea turtles, sea turtles and, and um, many species in nature. Yeah. So unfortunately, you have like the poor sea turtles who hatch and they can't find their way back into the ocean because they're distracted by the lights on shore. And then you have birds that, you know, they're kind of diverted from the migratory patterns by... And they end up, you know, hitting buildings and, and dying. And so there's well, a lot. There, there, there was the interesting study with the World Trade Center beacons for the memorial that, that I remember you relating to me at one point. That was just one of the most eye-opening things I've heard. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if you can tell that story. Mm -hmm. I can. <laughs> um, most people are probably familiar with the, the two twin beams of light that they use um, on the anniversaries of the 9-11 disaster. And um, this is also uh, done during the time of bird migration in the New York area. So migrating birds will be passing through New York City, and these two intense beams of light basically attract the birds. They sort of become hypnotized by these, and they'll fly and fly and fly around within those beams of light, essentially until they become exhausted and, and plunge to their death. Um, also, tall illuminated buildings birds will just fly directly into them and, and collide. Yeah. So turning off those lights are really good. If, if you ever get a chance, I've seen some people that have shot time-lapse photography in New York City during, during that, and now there are watchers that, that stay up at night to look for, with binoculars to look for birds in the, the beams of light, and they'll, they'll kill the beams so that the birds have a chance to fly off. I don't know how many of them return <laughs> when they come back on, but, but at least people are making an effort now to try to, um, to not be killing birds as we're trying to memorialize some people. Yeah, well, it's many people off the coast of Florida have a, a curfew, and so they draw their curtains at 8 o'clock or whatever, and that helps the situation for the hatching sea turtles too. So there are measures being taken. Um, um, what, um, what, what can you say about responsible lighting? So you mentioned that before. Uh, in fact, we have a question from uh, Michael asking uh, how can 
everyone out of this light pollution in addition to these other measures being taken. Ah, well, that's a very good. <laughs> we could actually show you a small demo if you'd like. Yes, please. Oh, that's right, the demo. And this is our demo of the week! <laughs> you can set this up properly. Okay. Try not okay. to get dizzy. Try not to get dizzy. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, let me show them the activity first before Stay you dim the light. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we're going to try to orient this so you can actually, you may have to actually be the. Point up there. Yeah. Yeah. Almost, you can almost see it. Okay, you might have to get a little closer. Houses. And a bus! Bus! It's not just one of them! You know, you know, Nicole, you're all garbled. I don't know exactly why, but... Yeah, it, your your audio is getting pixelated. Now, there you go. Oh, is that what that is? Yeah, it's it's a compression rate issue. <laughs> okay, so you have to hold it up. So you want me to hold this? Yeah, you got to get pretty tired doing that, but that's the only way I can wow. see. Wow. Right. Yeah. So we have a little city scene here. It has to go a little bit so that it's in the cross streets are in the crosshairs of this uh, screen here. Okay, so we have a city scene. We have somebody that refuses to stand up. Um, we have a couple of cars I stole from my 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 son. <laughs> he doesn't mind at all though. Um, and people not to scale basically. <laughs> and then we have. Let me see if I can click this to you. It's an unscale model. Unscale model. <laughs> here are our street lights, and this is really unscale. But anyways, it gives you an idea. And uh, so you have the street light that is um, at our corner here, standing next to somebody. Can you see that there? Yes, I. Yeah. Yes. So it's kind of hard because I have a little window looking at you guys. Um, and then we have what you're going to see a little bit later on is our very high technology portable planetarium. It has it's a box that's like one of these mug boxes that you tape shut so that all the corners are sealed and you don't get any light leak, and you have your students puncture holes, about 100 holes in the top, and they curse you afterwards. And you can't have them mass produced for some reason. That they, well, anyways, but they, that's another long one. <laughs> and then you have another, a second mag light, you can see here, that serves as your uh, source of light for the portable planetarium. Okay? That's what we're going to use in a few minutes. I'm not sure you're going to be able to see the stars that come out of here, but that's the, um, what you would do if you had the opportunity uh, where you are. And then we don't usually give away the punchline, but while the while the light's on here, we have a um, shield, and it is a PVC cap that we have shellacked, so it's not transparent, and we we leave the inside white because a lot of lights have re a reflective surface, which maximizes or optimizes their capacity for sh for lighting where you want it lit. All right. Are you, sure, are you tired yet? Not yet. Not, not yet. <laughs> I'm going to have to go around and shut off the lights because the poor guy's holding this darn thing. Yeah, when the laptop falls, you'll know. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to plummet to earth. Oh, okay. I'll be careful then. All right. <laughs> that would be one heck of a meteorite given the size of that town. Okay. So I'm not sure. You can see this because we have the light from the, uh, the uh, Mac, my, my Macintosh here that's kind of lighting up the scene. But if you are able to see that, I'm trying to look. Let me see. Try to... Well, ironically, the area around the street light is the darkest area of the town. Ah, yeah. So she it, can it doesn't. See. It's usually it's over exaggerated here. But usually in a very dark room, um, you will see this much darker than it's appearing here. But the point of all this is, you you I usually do this with a bunch of kids, and I ask them that just one question. They have. They, they cannot turn off the street light. That's the number one rule. But the one question basically is, what can you do to direct this light down instead of up into space where it's totally wasted, right? Mm -hmm. And so they finally get it. They, 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 what do you think the number one answer is? What do you think? Come on, you three. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you if you don't if you don't want to guess. You want me to tell you? Point it or cover it? I, I don't, don't understand small children. So yeah, <laughs> turn it upside down. Turn it upside down. There you go. <laughs> Rather a cute response, but anyways. Levitating streetlights. Levitating streetlights. <laughs> but finally, I mean, for one, in one instance, we had a kid come over with a pizza, and say, "Oh, you just cap it, right?" And when you cap it. You're causing all the light to go down, right? So we have this cap. We finally show them, and when you do that, all the light is is directed downwards. And I don't know how well it's showing up where you are. You guys are. Looks really good. Yeah. And so now you can talk about other things as well. Okay. 
You're making it safer for the people at the intersection. There's no glare, so the pe people coming down the street are not affected. Their eyesight's not affected by the glare from the, the light source. You just see the effect on the ground, the footprint. And that's what you want. You want, it, you want the light where you need it, and you can talk about when you need it and how much you need. All right? So those two factors, the when and the, and the how much, you can go into ta uh, you know, little speeches about curfews and motion centers, sensors and timers and all sorts of things that you could in employ. And then the most important part, I think, besides the shielding, though, is the type of light you can use. And then you can get into conversations about the kinds of lights that are more energy efficient. And if, if you do that, you can say, okay, if I cap this and all the light's going down, can you reduce the wattage on that bulb? Right, yeah. Of course, the answer is yes. And then you save what? Audience. Money, power, <laughs> carbon. Hey. Oh. All those yes, two things. That's all of exactly them. right. So, um, and so it's a win win, win win situation. The other win is the safety, and the other win is you can see the night sky much better, right? Because you're shielding your, your lights. And then that's, that's the point where we show them the before and the after, with and without the shield. Of what the um, what it would look like, so you could see the stars. Ooh, the shiny! You see the stars? Yeah. Okay. Now we can't. It's too close. Good <laughs> <laughs> <Would> before. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I'm not a very good Vanna White, so <laughs> <laughs> you're fine. And so that in a nutshell is our is our um, light shielding demo, and and this has been done qu quite a few ways with very similar all across the world. Well, one, one of the awesome things that you can learn from this particular demo is is the type of street light that you're mimicking with this mag light without the shield on it is one of those standard candle top lights. A lot of historic neighborhoods have them. Much like to my yours. shame, yeah. my community just re replaced all of its nice shielded reflected lights with historic lighting that is just like the one you built. And the irony of these unshielded globe on the top of the pole lights is if you're leaning against the pole, you're in the deepest shadow. Awesome. And, and it's only by having the light reflected downwards instead of having the bottom part of the light lost to the pole the light is on um, that you actually succeed in illuminating around the pole. Yeah, the International Dark Sky Association has a beautiful set of slides and there's one slide just like that where someone, uh, you can see them standing about four feet from such a light and then in the next um, slide, they're, you don't know where they are, you can't see them, but they've only moved four feet underneath, yeah. directly underneath the light and you can't see them anymore. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of good slides like that that exemplify um, well, how not to light, actually. <laughs> Have you ever used this demo with adults? Um, you know, oh, so yeah. as you go to like town meetings and things to try to talk to people about correct lighting, um, sensible lighting. And I've, I've certainly used right. this with the city council. Yeah. <laughs> and um, how did they this, do? Uh, they did fine. And the, <laughs> thing, the thing I like about this demo that makes it so great is that anyone that doesn't get it from a kid to, to an adult, and even an elected official, <laughs> um, gets it when they see this. Yeah. yeah. They yeah, understand, yeah. I, I mean, if they don't care anything about astronomy, they understand glare. And mm -hmm. um, they understand mm -hmm. how it gets so much better when you shield that light. You could talk about light trespass, you know, into another person's window from this demo. That's another type of light pollution. And then, of mm -hmm. course, the, um, you know, with and without the cap, you can talk about sky glow, basically. And that's a, the third type of major light pollution um, effect. So, yeah, that's a pretty good demo. And we, we've used it everywhere. You cannot believe how many places we've used this thing. So is it maybe time to set the light? I think his arms are getting tired. What, can we sit, tell him he can sit? <laughs> I think so. We can do that. Yes, yes. All right. Okay. Hold on to your eyes if you're watching. Hold on to your eyes, yeah. Hold on, kids. Woo! All right, not that. Whoa! <laughs> And that's a simple demo. Yeah, anyone could bring to their, I guess, city council to talk about that. Obviously, Pamela, it seems it's too late for your neighborhood. They, they it is <laughs> far too late for, late for my neighborhood. Um, yeah. 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 Um, this is a demo. The demo that anyone can do. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I get like we shouldn't have gone stronger, but that demo really brought it extra hope for me. It's really yeah, Nicole, it's really hard. Nicole, to yeah, you just became a modern art experiment. It was really kind of awesome. And a robot, <laughs> almost. 
<laughs> so, so one of the things that, that you just brought up, Scott, is uh, that you are going before city councils. You are talking to people about city ordinances. How has the data that, that kids, uh, teachers, community members have taken been able to actually influence legislation around the United States and the world? One, Norman, I'll Okay, well, you okay. tell it then. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody tell us. <laughs> She's like whispering the answer in my ear. <laughs> no, there, there's one really, really good example, and it's actually on uh, one of the slides there. Um, I think it's slide 25, uh, where a city uh, during one Globe at Night campaign took data, both visual and took about 500 data points that were visual data points throughout their city, and then another 500 with that sky quality meter you know, um, about playing card size device uh, that, um, that takes also the same type of data. And they made maps and they showed the city council and it took about two years for them to get the lighting um, regulations through, but they, they did it. They, but, and this was part of the process. This, oh. this data helped them to get it uh, verified, to get it actually the, the codes made. If that makes any sense. <laughs> so, so there's the, the right, image yes. showing the before and after where you can actually see that the city got dark. Oh, no, that's something that's else. A different one, oh, that's a no, that's a good example because that one there does show you exactly what, what uh, Pamela said. Uh, they, this city in Chile decided to uh, retrofit their, their lights, and they, you can see that you could, it's, it's such a difference because the footprint you can see on the ground, you don't see the lights anymore, and that's what you want. You want just the effect and not the source of light. And so am I allowed to, to use a commercial message for a major big box retailer? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so we're, we're pretty excited that uh, Lowe's now carries dark sky friendly fixtures in all of their stores. Oh, that's awesome. And many of them um, feature a display and it talks about neighbor friendly lighting so that the light goes where you want it and not in all across the neighborhood. Um, uh, Home Depot carries a couple as well, but Lowe's has really just had a big rollout just in the last two months or so. And um, we're, we're pretty excited because one of the things that has always happened is you give this talk and people are like, yes, I want to make a change, and where do I buy it? And you go, well, <laughs> and it's not that way anymore. It's really easy That's to go really and fabulous. find the right fixture for your home and, and make a switch up. Mm -hmm. So, so we have we have a question actually about where where you need data taken. Uh, so, in in general, uh, Chris Rand asks which data set has more value: data from a rural area or data from a major metro area? Actually, you need both. Uh, you okay. Need, you need the rural area because it sets the bar basically of how dark you can you can possibly get, mm -hmm. and it shows the world you know the, the best parts of of having such a dark night mm -hmm. sky. And you need the city because that's where the problems are. And so you need to monitor, especially the city, from year to year to year. And even the rural area to see if it's not getting any worse, if it's still maintaining its good dark skies. And so um, we, we advocate to do it not just one time in one place, but actually to spread as many measurements as you can throughout the city and to, you know, so you can create a map. And then also um, to do that yearly, at least. Yeah, and, and you talked about, oh, go ahead, Scott, sorry. I was going to say, you know, earlier we saw the, the whole Earth at night picture, and you might wonder, well, why do we need to do this if we have the picture of the Earth at night? And you, you need to remember that, that um, the light that goes through is a little different from what gets scattered around in the atmosphere. And so that's a picture of what you can see from space, which is not the same as what we, ex you know, have to deal with down here. Yeah. So that, that measurement provides a, a literal ground truth to what the satellites tell us and um, can be really, really valuable to have. Right. You mentioned so, earlier the Adopt-A-Street program. Can you tell us um, how that came about and what part that plays um, with the rest of the program? Well, there were uh, people um, scattered around the globe that actually wanted to do more uh, than just one measurement and wanted to do it in a systematic way. So we thought about it and we tried it a couple of years ago in Tucson and it worked really, really well. If you take a look at the 2011 and 2012 data, you'll see that things are very much evenly spread along roads, <laughs> north and south and east and west in Tucson. <laughs> And that's that's primarily because what we did was we just you know picked about uh, you know about twenty actually we picked about seventy streets uh, in Tucson and a good fraction of that was populated by people who signed up and we don't take their names and anything like that it just says adopted across the street so they know 
that they have that street and they go and it could be a seven mile street they just go once every mile and take a data point and then submit it online and it comes out to be a nice grid throughout town and last year we um, opened it up to Fayetteville, Arkansas, and they, they had like no measurements the year before, or maybe I think it was three measurements, and then it opened up and it was like at least a hundred measurements they got uh, last year, which was really, really nice. So that was a big improvement for them. And so we're, we have uh, about ten other sites, maybe a dozen sites now that have uh, signed up and they're, they're doing it around the world and we're, we're trying to get more people. So every time you do that, we actually create a web page explicitly for that town. And they can sign up because they've, they've given us their names of the streets that they want to um, cover. And they've given us, they've sort of gone through and edited that little description we have of the Adopt a Street program to fit their situation. And we make a web page just for them. You, you need to get newspapers to have their uh, newspaper delivery humans uh, do their delivery routes as dark sky things. Oh, that's I a like good it. idea. Yeah. I like it. We'll, we'll, we'll take that under serious consideration <laughs> in the next program. That's great. So you can get to that on our home page. It's right in the middle of the page on our home page. It just says if you're really keen on doing something like this, hit this button. <laughs> okay. So, go ahead, Georgia. <laughs> So, so one of the things that I've been really amazed to watch you accomplish over the years was back in 2009, uh, you worked with the IAU and the UNESCO World Heritage Foundation on passing dark sky ordinances, and that's now starting to become a reality, and I'd love to hear you talk about how we're not just protecting uh, melting architecture anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> the B5 resolution, or do you mean something more? Uh, the, the UNESCO World Dark Skies Heritage Sites. Oh, okay. Um, yes, they're, they're, I'm not sure exactly what to expound upon this, but um, they're doing a lot to um, protect it. it well, what, this is a Starlight Initiative, mostly, and it's not uh, quite my, my bailiwick. This is a brainchild of Cipriano Marin, and he is you know, basically the lead expert in this. And uh, he created something called the Starlight Initiative. It was about in 2007, I think, he started creating this. And um, he expressly wanted to protect the uh, World uh, Heritage Sites, not just because of the landscapes, but because of the sky, which is also a landscape. The night sky is just as precious to preserve as anything else, like the landscape itself. And that's what he was trying to make um, clear to people and to take the measures through the UN and UNESCO um, to, to make that possible. And, and, if, and if I can take a sidestep just a little bit, um, International Dark Sky Association just this week proclaimed two new dark sky places, um, Brecon Beacons National Park in Wales, uh, is a new international dark sky reserve. So it's home to 33,000 people, but a big national park there, and they've done lighting retrofits, and they've measured the night sky. Um, it's a great place when it's clear in Wales to go stargazing. And then today we announced Death Valley National Park in California as our newest international dark sky park, and it's the largest in the world. And the hottest. <laughs> yes, it is. The hottest and the lowest elevation. Mm. So, so maybe um, what, what uh, Scott... You might want Scott to do is explain a little bit more about the International Dark Sky Association, which is, you know, different from the Starlight Initiative, but uh, they have their own sort of dark sky programs for parks and uh, for um, reserves and things. That that sounds good. And afterwards, I'm going to ask the two of you from some for some closing remarks as we near the one hour mark. So go ahead, Scott. At the end of the debate, our, <laughs> our closing remarks. Connie will give the rebuttal. Uh, <laughs> so, um, International Dark Sky Association is a, is a non-profit organization and, and we've been around for 25 years now and we work to um, protect the night sky and, and um, we try to provide guidance on, on lighting legislation and, and how to do good lighting and how to do retrofit lighting and we, we have this Dark Sky Places program that I mentioned earlier with Dark Sky Parks and Dark Sky Communities and Dark Sky, uh, yeah, and Dark Sky Communities. I, uh, so there are just four of those in the world, uh, of the communities and um, five reserves and 11 parks now. And so we, we're just in the process of, of trying to raise awareness, trying to, to work with NOAO and Globe at Night to, to, to do that. And uh, Connie's actually on our board of directors as well. 
And um, so that's IDA in a nutshell. Very brief. Yeah. yeah, and so it's a great organization to support if you're, you know, if you'd like to do that. And to go to their website, it's www.darksky.org. Yes, thank you. And um, hold on again, I just <laughs> did something really silly again. No, we're looking at Kaiser I now. know. <laughs> <laughs> It's attack of the inbox. <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, we can see you. We never know. <laughs> Forgive me for pointing. I I, I'm becoming more savvy at this. It's my first time hanging out. So. Yeah, so yeah. Well, we're, we're, we will be certain to have you back because Globe at Night is one of our favorite partners here at CosmoQuest, and we want everyone out there who has clear skies to go out and look up and and when the globe at night is running campaigns to go out and record what you see and then when it's cloudy come inside and of course do moon mappers and all of our other CosmoQuest activities uh, or when you get too cold and you've reported your data uh, just remember always report your data um, so so uh, just to remind people of what's going on before I get the final remarks from these two, this has been Learning Space, hosted by the audio pixelated Nicole Gallucci <laughs> <laughs> and Georgia Bracey. And I just stopped in because Connie is an old friend. I'm Dr. Mm -hmm. Pamela Gay. Um, and, and this is sponsored every week by CosmoQuest. You can tune in at 4 Pacific, 7 Eastern, uh, Midnight GMT, and find out how you can better learn. Uh, we have a demo of the week. We giggle a lot about how we can learn new things about science. Factoid of the week, they put radio receivers on bats and figure out how they react to the dark. I, I love that. I'm going to be sharing that with anyone who sits still too long this week. Um, you can tune in tomorrow at noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, uh, 9 GMT in order to uh, learn what's going on at the Planetary Society with host Emily Lakdawalla. And on Friday, Nicole will be uh, hosting along with Fraser Kane the weekly space hangout. No, now, <laughs> Fraser and I are hosting this Friday's <laughs> weekly space hangout where we bring you whatever's new in space news. Um, and then, of course, Sunday night is our virtual star party. Tune into the event page because the time changes as the sun changes. Yeah. Connie yeah, Scott, fun. it's it's been <laughs> wonderful to have you on this evening. Final words for our audience. Okay, could I show? Let me see if oh, I did it again. Could I show uh, uh, like a yes a, show? Film or something? I'm not going to point. Okay, um, there we go. well, this is. Let me see if I can share it first. Okay. And it'll come up and it'll, yep, okay, good. And there, oh, beautiful. Oh. The world at night. Yep, this is the world at night. We um, host this during the Global Astronomy Month, and I would I would um, advocate that anyone who's really keen on such things, go, uh, Google's Globe, Global Astronomy Month, excuse me, mm -hmm. and because it starts in April, it has a number of activities in there, including a bunch of dark skies activities, which also includes the International Dark Skies Week promoted by the International Dark Sky Association. So, uh, and another thing is the wonderful Earth and Sky Photo Contest that anyone anywhere in the world can participate awesome. in. And last year we had about 600 um, people involved from all over the world. And let me just show you a little bit about what uh, this, this looks like. Here. That's stunning. It's going to just show, I'll show you just part of the video. And this is why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. Okay, for some reason the video isn't coming through. We're just getting the sound. So well, we will we? post the link to that. It could be copyright prevention. They're pretty good about doing that with the browsers now. Uh, we will post a link to the video. Um, which disappears the second you press play, um, but but oh, that's stunning. Yeah, see, they're all stunning. Maybe if I could, all right, hop through, but that's okay. So yeah. we we will share the link, and uh, Nicole is pointing out in the chat that uh, we are actually creating radio pollu pollution when scientists put radio transceivers on the bats. So. <laughs> One person's science is another person's noise, to, to quote uh, Nicole's common phrase. Isn't there a program called Quiet Skies 
There is. And that's Honey, I, was, I know we're kind of out of time, but I was going to ask that too. But there you go for Nicole. <laughs> Quiet so we'll time. have to have you yes. back to talk about radio Sorry. protection and the fact that there's a school uh, near Green Bank Observatory that actually isn't allowed to have Wi-Fi in the school to keep the skies safe for the radio telescopes. So this has been an hour that went far too fast. Thank you so yeah. much for joining us, Connie and Scott, and uh, I look Thank forward to any time. Yeah, great to see you guys. Yeah, Thank you so much, everybody. Well, Our bye. pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.